Mayor, I just wanted to welcome everybody. Uh, appreciate all the congressional staff that, that showed up and are interested in, in learning a little bit about uh, what's happening in Yemen and some new analysis on the impact of U.S. military support to the Saudi-led coalition uh, by our esteemed panelists here. So. Um, the Washington Post and the Security Force Monitor at Columbia Law School uh, uh, Human Rights Institute, uh, they've published a really comprehensive report that I suggest folks may have, if folks haven't read it already, I would really uh, urge people read that report and we'll share that in some of the follow-up materials uh, after the webinar session. Uh, and I think they provide some of the most complete, um, you know, in-depth, look at the, you know, the sheer support that we are providing the Saudi-led coalition's air campaign um, and, you know, really highlighting that a lot of those airstrikes, uh, you know, we need more data on, but that most likely they were used to, to kill civilians in Yemen. And we're going to be uh, hearing more about that report uh, by the authors of that groundbreaking study um, in Yemen. A fragile UN brokered truce has temporarily succeeded uh, in pausing Saudi airstrikes and Houthi drone attacks, which is very promising. Um, and, uh, you know, but still there are, uh, you know, the Saudi led uh, coalition's naval blockade on medicines is still in place. Uh, you know, travel remains tenuous, so we're watching that closely. Uh, in May, Reps Pramila Jayapal, Peter DeFazio, Nancy Mace, and Adam Schiff introduced HJ Res 87, a Yemen war powers resolution to end all U.S. participation in the Saudi-led coalition war in Yemen. The resolution now has over 100 co-sponsors uh, and over 100 national organizations have endorsed the effort. Uh, this report and this legislation come as the Biden administration has announced a uh, Middle East trip uh, that includes a controversial stop to Saudi Arabia and an expected meeting uh, with Saudi Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman, despite you know pre previous campaign promises uh, to make Saudi Arabia uh, to really reform the U.S.-Saudi relationship. So we're going to be hearing more about that soon. So again, at this event, uh, panelists will offer insights on this new analysis on the depth and breadth of U.S. support for the Saudi air cam campaign updates on the humanitarian crisis and the U.S. role, uh, highlights from the ground in Yemen, and also uh, taking a look at both new legislation and the forthcoming Biden trip. So before, um, I'm going to hand it over to our esteemed panelists who authored that groundbreaking study, uh, uh, Priyanka uh, Modaparthi and Tony Wilson. Um, you know, so as I, you know, hand it over to you, I'll just maybe, you know, give your quick bios here. Uh, Priyanka is the director of the Counterterrorism, Armed Conflict, and Human Rights Project at Columbia Law School's Human Rights Institute. She previously investigated human rights abuses and war crimes at uh, Human Rights Watch for nearly a decade and led several investigations about abuses in Yemen. She's a regular media commentator, and her writing has appeared on several news outlets, including CNN, Foreign Policy, Newsweek, and The New Yorker Online. Uh, welcome. Welcome. Tony uh, Wilson is the director and founder of the Security Force Monitor, where uh, since 2016 he has led research into the police, militaries, and other security forces of over 20 countries. Uh, uh, Tony's uh, work has supported an NGO submission to the Office of the Prosecutor uh, of the International Criminal Court on potential crimes against humanity committed by the Mexican Army, an investigation of killings by the Philippine National uh, Police, published in the Atlantic um, video analysis of killings of protesters by the Nigerian Army, published in the New York Times, an analysis of U.S. support for the Saudi and Emirati-led coalition's war in Yemen, um, in a joint investigation with the Washington Post. So uh, really appreciate uh, you both being here. So we're going to have a conversation with them. They're going to share, uh, you know, some insights on their analysis. We're going to open it up for a question and answer and then turn the panel over to uh, Marcus Stanley and Shireen Alademi uh, uh, for the next portion of our conversation. Um, so first off, congrats to both of you on the release of this groundbreaking expose. I know that you both spent countless hours, uh, you know, documenting uh, so much and, you know, just huge accomplishment. 
So first, I'd like to ask, um, you know, what were the steps you took to determine whether U.S. sales of planes, weapons or equipment likely benefited Air Force units that could have or did serve in the Emirati coalition's war in Ye- uh, Saudi Emirati coalition war in Yemen? What did your findings show about U.S. participation in that air war? And what are really the main takeaways you'd like to present to congressional staff as, um, you know, they think about U.S. policy towards Yemen, uh, the possible trip, and, you know, what are the big takeaways that you have for our audience? And I'll, with that, I'll open it up to both of you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm sharing my screen, which hopefully is successful. Uh, and hi, everyone. I'm Tony Wilson. I'm the founder and director of the Security Force Monitor Project at the Columbia Law School Human Rights Institute. I'll speak a little bit first about the research uh, that we did into the coalition and the US support for the coalition. And I'll turn it over to my colleague Priyanka, who will speak more to the human rights implications and uh, questions around US culpability for violations committed in Yemen. Um, So first, just very briefly about Security Force Monitor. Uh, It's, as I said, it's a project and our focus is really on supporting journalists, human rights researchers, litigators, others who are working to hold police, military, or other security forces accountable for the violations that they commit. And we've done that through open source research. So, First, a little housekeeping before we go into uh, the specifics of Yemen. Um, The key unit, oh, sorry. I see the, did the wrong one. There, is that working now? Great, whoops. Um, so anyway, continuing on. Uh, and the first real slide with uh, content. Um, so a little housekeeping before we get into the coalition. Um, the key unit of understanding the coalition's air campaign are squadrons. I don't know, you're saying that word a lot, squadrons, squadrons, squadrons. Um, this is the most basic unit of air forces around the world. It's generally one type of aircraft, um, and they usually serve one purpose. So it'd be an airstrike squadron, a transport squadron, a reconnaissance squadron, what have you. And these are really key to understanding the role of who's done what in Yemen, in particular, who's participated in the airstrike campaign. And this leads nicely into what I think is the kind of the key foundation for the Washington Post article, which is the universe of squadrons carrying out airstrikes is a narrow and notable one. When the war in Yemen began, numerous sources said Bahrain was sending F-16s, Saudi was sending uh, F-15s, mirages were coming from the Emirates, so on and so forth. And so we had a huge range of sources that said different countries were sending specific types of planes to serve in Yemen. And so what the research we did is using open, again, all open source research, nothing leaked, nothing nothing confidential. Um, Using open source research, we were able to understand what all the squadrons for all of the Air Force units in all of the countries that served in the coalition were flying and then determine which one of those can actually conduct airstrikes and served in Yemen. And it comes to this kind of key finding, which is out of all the countries of the coalition, there's 39 squadrons that could have served in Yemen. So this is from a graphic from the Washington Post piece, which shows all of those 39 squadrons um, that could have conducted airstrikes and, and served in Yemen. If they're grayed out, we just know that those country, the country sent those types of planes and those squadrons fly those types of planes. If they're orange, we know that those squadrons served. Um, and if they're dark orange, we know those squadrons definitely benefited from US contracts. 
the key thing to kind of flag here is for those other squadrons that have the orange highlight around them. Um, there was a lot of US contracting that went to uh, these various countries. So there's tons and tons of contracts, dozens and dozens of contracts that supported the F-16s for Bahrain. Because there's two squadrons in Bahrain that fly F-16s and both of them serve, we don't know if those contracts went to one of the squadrons or the other, but we do know, and this is really, really key, every Bahraini S-16 squadron served in Yemen. So any contract that went to support an F-16 from Bahrain went to benefit a squadron that potentially conducted an airstrike in Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, or the United Nations said were potential war crimes. Those groups, um, as well as Molotov for Human Rights, who I should not neglect, a uh, Yemeni-based organization, have documented over 300 plus airstrikes, which they have said are either violations of international law or potential war crimes. Similarly, for other countries like Kuwait, all of their FA-18 squadrons served in Yemen. For Saudi, every F-15S, SA, every tornado, every typhoon squadron served in Yemen. For the Emirates, every Emirati F-16 squadron served in Yemen. So this really raises the potential that all of this U.S. contracting is touching and supporting planes that potentially carried out these strikes. So just to very briefly, there's 39 squadrons that could have served in Yemen, and sources confirm at least 19 of those squadrons did serve. For the Saudi and Emirat and the Emirates, those squadrons almost got 100 contracts since the war began, went to benefit those squadrons that served in Yemen. Um, and again, every Bahraini and Emirati F 16 squadron, every Saudi F 15 S, SA, Tornado Typhoon squadron and every Kuwaiti F-18 squadron served in Yemen. So there's no way to support those planes for those countries without supporting a squadron that served in Yemen. And this support was so crucial and so sort of public that one of the key aspects of our investigation was this video from El Arabiya that about a year after the first F-15 SA landed in Saudi Arabia, it was proudly announced that it was going to be, those planes were now being sent to bomb Yemen. Um, and actually we used this video in particular to identify a couple of squadrons that were conducting airstrikes on those days. So really without US support, um, it's hard to see how the coalition would have done anything in Yemen. So I'm going to very briefly describe, how do we know all that stuff? Um, the sources of our information are actually um, not human rights sources, um, and if anything, they are biased towards uh, the military or you know very kind of neutral sources. They're focused on the types of planes flown by various countries, their capabilities, the weapons they carry, the equipment they carry. And, sorry. Working from home and having a cat. Um, and using that information, we were able to document and understand what all of the squadrons fly, what equipment those planes carry, and what weapons they use. Um, when we knew that, we also were able to look at open sources to understand and identify which squadrons served in them. Sometimes it's a very specific statement, like this one, identifying the sixth squadron of Jordan served in Yemen. And sometimes it was using the tail numbers of specific planes that we could see in videos. Like for instance, this video, which shows tail number 111 Bahrain, which we can tie to a Bahrain F-16 and to the first squadron of Bahrain. And you'll see that the video also shows us the second squadron to away and uh, an Emirati squadron as well. And with all that information, how did we tie it to US cities? So every day, the DOD announces contracts for the US military as well as for foreign countries. And it was literally just a process of going through every day's announcement, reading the contracts and finding which ones went to the various 
coalition countries. And then from there, um, if they were servicing a type of plane, a type of equipment, or a type of weapon carried by squadrons we know or uh, were potentially serving in Yemen, or we thought we know were serving in Yemen. Additionally, we also looked at the major arms sales, um, but those are kind of fewer and far between. So really the, the meat of the US support is actually in those DOD daily announcements. All of this data is analyzed and published at the end of the Washington Post article. And we've also made it freely available as a spreadsheet as well. Um, I'm going to just end very briefly, my time's almost up, um, on some open questions. And biggest in my mind is Egypt. We weren't able to tie any specific Egyptian F-16 squadron to Yemen, but open sources did show tail numbers, which if we could tie it to a specific squadron, uh, would likely be any of those squadrons with the big question marks on them, which is basically most of the Egyptian F-16 squadrons. Um, I'll leave it there. I'll turn it over to Priyanka. All of our data and information is on our site, securityforcemonitor.org, or our data platform, whoisincommand.com. And of course, you can reach me, uh, as you've seen my email, Tony at securityforcemonitor.org. Thank you. Thanks so much, Tony. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And here we are. Okay. Um, so first of all, you know, thank you to all of you for being with us here today. It's so good to be here and to be able to share some of the key findings and key import of this research that Security Force Monitor conducted in collaboration with the Washington Post. And I want to share, you know, some thoughts and, and context on, on these new findings. Um, I want to share some thoughts on, you know, why this research was so important and what it has added to our knowledge of U.S. support to the war in Yemen. Throughout the past seven years of war, human rights investigators, journalists, and other researchers have really focused on two main data points when examining U.S. support for the war in Yemen. The first was refueling of coalition aircraft, US refueling of coalition aircraft, including Saudi and Emirati aircraft. We know that the US did this for a few years, and many agreed this made the US a direct party to the conflict in Yemen. However, US refueling did stop in late 2018. The second source of information we had was around the use of US weapons in the Yemen war including in apparently unlawful, unlawful attacks, many that appeared to be war crimes. U.S. weapons used included multiple uses of cluster munitions that killed or harmed civilians and were used in civilian areas, as well as the use of U.S. guided bombs and attacks, including several well-known incidents that killed civilians, such as an attack on a funeral hall, one that killed children on a school bus, and attacks on marketplaces and on food production sites. Finally, we know the overall amount of U.S. arms sales to coalition countries, which quickly rose into the billions. However, until this joint investigation from the Post and the Monitor, there was little data on how these sales directly benefited specific units in coalition countries' militaries. Now, Security Force Monitor and the Post have established that only a very small number of units could have been responsible for attacks that were apparent war crimes. As Tony has pointed out, for Saudi Arabia, this is a universe of just 10 airstrike capable squadrons, all of which almost certainly benefited from US military contracts and most very likely continue to benefit. Mapping specific squadrons, specific military units, perpetrators and commanders is an essential step in establishing accountability, including criminal responsibility for war crimes. But until now, no member of a coalition military has been prosecuted or held responsible for their role in these incidents. As far as we know, the same commanders who oversaw these devastating attacks and the same pilots who carried them out continue to be responsible for military operations in Yemen. I also want to raise the significant risk that US officials face for aiding and abetting these war crimes. Under international law, there's no requirement 
that someone uh, potentially liable for aiding and abetting has the purpose or desire to facilitate the underlying offense, which in this case would be attacks that are apparently war crimes. It is enough that state agencies or officials knew that such an act would assist or had the substantial likelihood of assisting the commission of the underlying offense. In other words, it is enough to know that US support to these units could, you know, would assist or substantial, have a substantial likelihood of assisting um, the commission of an apparent war crime. And over time, this risk grows because attacks that appear, you know, attacks that appear to be war crimes continued over many years of the war in Yemen. And measures the US has taken to try and mitigate or avoid these, these attacks have proven to be largely ineffective. Now I just want to go away, you know, before we end, I'll go away some key takeaways from all of this. First of all, there are significant risks for continuing support for US officials who could be liable for aiding and abetting war crimes. While there is a truce in effect, there are also violations of that truce, and we don't know how long the truce will continue. The new research from Security Force Monitor and The Post shows that US officials should have been able to discern which coalition units were involved in apparent war crimes. And it's not clear why support to units likely involved in, in abuses continues. So I think, you know, just to recap, I think this new investigation, this new research that was collected over a period of years really elevates and brings into sharp relief some of the questions that many of you have raised all along. Why is the US continuing support, support to members of the coalition? What does the US know and what can it know about um, US support and what role it has played in attacks that are apparent war crimes? And if these questions cannot be answered at this time, why have officials not done the work to find the answers to these questions? So we'll leave it there and we look forward to your, to your questions. Thanks so much. Well, thank you all so much. Uh, for your service and just the the you know I guess I'm gonna jump to the the Q and A chat soon, but I had two two quick questions I wanted to ask before we get started. How long did this take you? I mean to dig through all of that data. I mean that's just an incredible feat. And also, what do you think was like the most surprising takeaway that really challenged your original assumptions? Um. Thank you. Um, well, I'll say it did take quite a while uh, for the for the research to come together. Um, but one of the most surprising things that once it was kind of all tied together in a bow um, that came out was this information on which squadrons were serving um, by the end of 2016 was out there. So that information was not recent information. It was early on in the early days of the war. Um, you could have, and by you, the US government could have used the same public sources to make the same determinations on which units were serving um, very, very quickly. And for most countries, even earlier in the war. And I think that was very surprising to me. Um, and, and additionally, you know, there were some units that took quite a bit of time to track down. But the bulk of the research came from a small number of sources that, again, were readily available, um, very clear, did not really take any particular um, analysis on our part as far as the tail numbers or maybe even more sophisticated things. It was, it was text-based sources that said, this unit from this country served. Um, and even then, even if you had a, kind of a, a question, the fact that you could say, well, there's two F-16 squadrons from Bahrain, Bahrain sent F-16s. It's not that hard to kind of raise concerns very early on. And I think those sorts of things are the small knowable universe of these squadrons was what really struck me almost immediately uh, when we kind of wrapped it all up. Maybe I'll just jump in and add. So Tony is being quite modest, but he has been, he and his collaborators have been working on this research since 2019. So it is the product of, you know, years of careful uh, checking of sources, you know, looking at uh, perhaps some unconventional sources or sources that human rights researchers and journalists have not thought to look at. 
Um, but I think, you know, what really stands out from this research is, um, first of all, you know, this is a small and knowable universe of squadrons that are implicated in these apparent war crimes, um, and, and that could have carried them out. And secondly, this is information that, you know, I believe lawmakers and their staff have been seeking for years, trying to better understand the U.S. role in supporting this war and contributing to civilian casualties, including some of these really horrific incidents we've seen over the years. And, you know, uh, yet I don't believe they've been able to get this information. Um, and so, you know, of course, those attending will know better than I do, but certainly, you know, this is knowable information. And while we have not been able to draw a direct line between specific squadrons and specific attacks, we believe this information does exist and is knowable um, to U.S. officials. That's so helpful and opens up so many more possibilities for legislation and, and advocacy. So again, thank you. So I'm going to jump into some of these great uh, questions we have uh, pouring in in the chat. Um, does you know the U.S. government provide this info in a public, organized, easily accessible location online? Um, you know, I, I will just maybe ask two and then hand it over to you. And is there any indication of how many DOD officials or personnel are involved in the assistance to the coalition? Maybe we'll, we'll start off with those two. Um, so searchable, easily findable, no. Uh, even on the contracting side, it really was a specific Google search to call all that information and pull it together and, and to analyze it. Um, and actually the, um, the, the major arms sales, you know, for certain countries like Saudi has five different tags on the site. So it uh, definitely is not easily knowable at all. Um, yeah. You know, I, yeah, so um, just building on that, I, I've done a bit of research into some of these questions myself and, and with uh, folks at uh, Center for International Policy, and we discovered that there are these military attaches that are sort of assigned also with the contracts, um, you, you know, where like you have a handful of DOD personnel and a whole bunch of private contractors that are you know all overseeing the spare parts and maintenance of these of these squadrons that you speak of i'm wondering if you could briefly touch on that uh, and stuff that you've found on that particular um issue yeah so i mean the the saudi arabia does have its own um, assistance agency um the u.s agency to assist Saudi Arabia and the various contracts. I mean, the, the number of personnel involved, uh, and unfortunately, I, I don't know that specific information, but we are talking about you know, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of contracts going out the door um, over the course of the years. Um, and so that you know, has kind of fairly huge implications for um, people involved to make it happen. And, you know, that these, Contracts have a really long shelf life. Um, the longest contract approved, or if the US didn't approve any more contracts other than the ones we looked at, which were from the seven years, from the start of the campaign to its seven year anniversary, the last contract would end in 2029. Um, so these things have a very long shelf life and tail um, implications for future administrations. And I'll just add, you know, as Tony said, we don't have insight, you know, there isn't transparency in the number of DOD personnel involved in overseeing these, these transactions, but I do want to point to a recent report from the Government Accountability Office, the GAO, um, that spoke about the role of the DOD and the State Department um, in, you know, overseeing U.S. support for the Yemen war. Um, and reporting on that report, uh, the GAO report itself is not publicly available. Uh, I understand it's classified, but you know, news reporting about it has shown that you know has has said that um, uh, these agencies have not taken adequate actions to understand whether U.S. defense articles have been used in attacks that killed civilians. Um, and you know, there are restrictions that you know 
in which US defense articles are supposed to be used only against legitimate military targets. Um, and the, uh, you know, the requisite um, follow up research, you know, investigations, what have you, these agencies have not carried them out, um, is what we understand from that report. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. And, and there was a classified version that was submitted to the Hill. They recently issued part of that publicly, which was very useful um, for our understanding in that we learned uh, the GAO told us that there was $60 billion of uh, you know, foreign military sales to both the Saudis and the Emiratis since the start of the Yemen war, which I thought was um, you know, really an incredible just amount of, of, uh, of military funding. Somebody asked a really important question about the Saudi blockade, uh, which is, is really uh, you know, a huge part of the humanitarian suffering in Yemen. Did you specifically uncover any squadrons uh, that could have been res uh, responsible for forcing the air and sea blockade? I mean, I know that might be hard to determine, but we understand there's a no-fly zone, there's a coalition holding area, and, uh, you know, if you could speak a little bit more on that, if you have any data. Sure, yeah. Um, so actually on the Hoods and Command platform, we have more information about the coalition outside of the airstrike campaign. So also units that were part of the refueling of the craft that conducted airstrikes or that played um, a reconnaissance role in the, uh, in the air campaign as well. Um, and so just to briefly touch on that, every F-15 squadron of both ones that can conduct airstrikes, but also ones that can only do reconnaissance from Saudi and served in Yemen. Um, in terms of the uh, naval blockade in particular, um, we did have sourcing that said basically there's two fleets in Saudi Arabia, the Western and Eastern fleet, and both were participating in naval operations in Yemen. Um, it's unclear if it was specific to the blockade, but I don't really know what other naval operations, you know, there were some strictly military operations that weren't just the blockade. Um, but that the implication then is, if that's the entire fleet, if those are both of the fleets, then that calls into question every ship in the Saudi Navy. Um, and we also mapped out you know, the Emirati Navy as well. Um, and then I think there are still questions about Egypt's role in naval operations um, and potentially blockade as, as well. So there are still, unfortunately, areas where you know, open source research can only tell you so much, but um, again, it was um, these seem like things that the U.S. government should and does have more information on. Yeah, and, and the Houthis don't have a navy, and they don't have an air force, so we can only imagine what you know those naval operations would be for. So, yeah, very very helpful. Um, so. You know, there's a few questions I feel like you've already uh, answered here in the chat, but maybe I could just kind of cluster a couple together just to, you know, give like a, maybe a, a reiteration of what you what you said earlier and maybe if you had anything else to share, but this has been incredibly illuminating. Um, so, you know, we usually only hear of the Saudi Air Force involvement in Yemen. You know, how many other countries have active, you know, squadrons in Yemen right now? Um, you know, I, I understand that the Emiratis are, have, uh, you know, aerial uh, operations in Yemen as well, but maybe you could speak to that. Um, you know, do you have, uh, again, I think you covered this a little bit earlier, but do you have any research to, on support to aircraft that don't in, directly engage in airstrikes, you know, surveillance, reconnaissance, um, you know, just different targeting and sort of, you know, more like the, and even maybe um, anti-AQAP uh, operations. Um, and maybe last, um, you know, actually this last one I might save for Marcus Stanley uh, and Shireen when we get into the advocacy portion. Wonderful. Yeah. So um, as far as the other countries involved, I think one of the things that I was struck by the research was the depth of involvement by you know, the smaller countries of the coalition. So obviously you have Saudi and the Emirates as kind of the big players or having the most capabilities, but you know, uh, every airstrike squadron for Kuwait and Bahrain served in Yemen, given it's only two for, for both of those countries, but that's 
big deal. And the implications of that, again, are you know, every F-16 squadron from Bahrain served, every F-A-18 squadron from Kuwait served, but even within the Saudis and the Emirates themselves, you know, every airstrike squadron from Saudi served and every F-16 squadron from the Emirates served. And so um, the depth of, of involvement for all of the countries is very, very high. Um, with again that open question about Egypt's participation, but given the very scarce sources we have, also is potentially very very high as well. Um, so really, um, the ramifications and and for the entire air forces, it's just very hard to find. For for many of the air forces, it's hard to find a unit that didn't serve in Yemen that's not potentially connected to, um, or the, where the concern isn't. To, did this unit conduct an airstrike that the UN or others have said is a potential war crime? Um, for the more support side of the coin, um, for the refueling, for the transport, for the other things, um, there's a much smaller universe of squadrons, but again, um, the, almost all or all of them for the various countries did serve um, as well. The, we do have more um, data on this on cruising command. It's sometimes a little hard to find. Um, but I'm happy to kind of respond to questions as well. But again, you know, the, the answer is basically anyone, any squadron that could do a thing was sent to Yemen. Wow, uh, just very interesting and so useful as we, you know, kind of think about advocacy and U.S. policy and you know where we should head from here. Obviously, you know, very happy to see the truce in place, but as you say, there are violations. We have not seen a complete lifting of the blockade. It's a fragile ceasefire, and escalations could happen again. You know, uh, the truce is supposed to, uh, you know, the, it was extended till August 2nd. Hopefully, there's an extension beyond that, but again, this is a very open and real question. Um, maybe I could, you know, ask. Uh, you all to, you know, I, I did have a question about the reception so far. Um, you, you know, like, you know, you've got this out there, you've got some great press on it. I saw it obviously in the Washington Post. Uh, we've got the New York Times covering the GAO report. We got the Guardian covering, I, I thought the Guardian covered your expose as well. Uh, I could be wrong about that, but you know, you, you've created, you know, some really important buzz and I've been hearing it, you know, as I have conversations on the Hill, uh, you know, people are reading this, people are looking at it and I'm wondering overall, what's the reception been? Thank you. Yeah, well, I think so far it's, it's been exciting um, and it's been great to get it, this kind of information out there in the world. And now I think um, in some ways, the real work begins of uh, asking the questions and kind of pursuing um, the lines of advocacy or potentially accountability or, or other things on top of this. Because um, if any airstrike could have been done by one of 39 squadrons, um, then you raise this question, well, which one did this specific airstrike? And if we can connect it to an airstrike, what assistance did it receive? Who's going to plane? You know, there's, there's sorts of things out there. So I'm very pleased to um, hopefully have this information serve as a foundation for um, more work, more, more um, kind of detailed questions and, and probing of the war, the US involvement in the war, and also you know, this raises questions about the British support of British made planes, you know, European support for other, other types of aircraft serving in Yemen. So it really, um, even after uh, a long research run is kind of the start of the, the process in some way. So I guess that's my, my view on it. I'll just add, you know, I think people are surprised at the amount of information that is available through open source, uh, you know, through open sources um, that is, you know, essentially publicly available. Uh, given the, the lack of transparency around U.S. support to the coalition, you know, there's been, I think, a lot of effort to kind of backstep from what that support really looks like. Um, and, you know, what this research does is really show how extensive the support is, again, to a relatively small set of, of squadrons of, of actors. Um, and so, you know, I think the fact that this is all publicly available really raises questions about 
why, you know, why don't we have more public information about the nature of the U.S. support and exactly what has been implicated? And I think it's time for some answers on these questions. I completely agree. We, we need to know what's going on with U.S. Uh, military support, involvement, weapon sales. Uh, you know, not just Saudi UAE, but, you know, more broadly, this opens up a whole conversation about U.S. military assistance um, that I think is just so needed. And I thank you both for your incredible work on this. I guess I want to uh, pass it to both of you to maybe give us the last word. Uh, know that there are plenty of folks here that are ready to, t you know, take this report, you know, turn it into concrete policy changes, uh, change the media narrative. So, you know, we're ready to ready to rock and roll here, but we want to hear from you maybe one last word before we transition uh, to our esteemed panelists, uh, Marcus and Shireen. Well, I'll just I'll just throw in briefly. Um, before Priyanka has more profound thoughts and what I'd be able to cobble together. Um, but I'll just say, you know, for me, I think the real question is, even if you're not supporting these squadrons with weapons, if they, um, or even if they're not involved in operations in Yemen anymore, the fact that they potentially did conduct an airstrike that others have said is a potential war crime really raises the question of like, how you can support these squadrons. Um, whether you can as well as if there's no sort of accountability process for it to determine, you know, if they did to hold those responsible accountable for their actions and some sort of uh, remediation of that, of those crimes, of those potential crimes. Um, and I think for me, that's really the, the, the question in all of this. I'll just add, you know, human rights considerations the consideration of whether civilian casualties are being caused with U.S. defense materials and U.S. military sales or U.S. military support, you know, these, the questions of, of human rights and civilian harm, civilian debts, are meant to figure into these policy considerations, into these decisions of whether the sales should go forward, whether they should continue, to what extent they should continue, or whether they should be halted. Completely. And while the investigation with the Post was a collaboration, we learned from it as well. One of the key points the article seemed to be making was that there does not exist either sufficient capacity or perhaps sufficient will within executive agencies to determine, you know, to report and determine whether these human rights considerations are really being taken into account. Um, I believe the article had some kind of figure where, you know, there's a new military. Uh, sale being considered, you know, just in an extraordinarily brief amount of time. Um, and so I think, you know, for everyone who is attending today, you know, what can, you know, what changes can be made to ensure that these agencies both have the capacity and skills and insight and expertise they need to be factoring in human rights concerns um, and, and these considerations of civilian deaths and injuries and other harm. Um, and, you know, are they using, if they do have that expertise and capacity, are they using it? If not, why not? Um, so, you know, I think a lot to be done there. And thanks again for having us, and, and all the organizations who sponsor this briefing. Yes, thank you. Uh, Tony Wilson, uh, Priyanka Modaparthi, thank you so, so much for being with us here today. Um, as we transition to speak with uh, Shireen Aladimi and Marcus Stanley, um, I, I just wanted to make a, a plug that, or a, a, a notice that, um, you, know, you know, Priyanka and Tony, they are here in more of a educational capacity. They don't endorse any particular uh, policy or, or a particular legislation. Um, so we will be discussing the, uh, you know, Yemen War Powers Resolution, HJ Res 87, which now enjoys, uh, you know, over 100 bipartisan co-sponsors. And I just wanted to make that clear that this, uh, they are no way endorsing this legislation, but uh, their, uh, you know, important expose and groundbreaking study gives us a lot of food for thought as we consider uh, where we should go from here. So thank you again, uh, you know, to both of you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to introduce uh, Shireen and, and Marcus at the same time and then uh, ask some questions of uh, 
Shireen first and then Marcus. Uh, Dr. Shireen uh, Aladimi is an assistant professor of education at Michigan State University. Since 2015, she has played an active role in raising awareness about the Saudi-led war in Yemen on her country of birth. Uh, you, you know, and she works to encourage political action to end this ongoing participation. Uh, she's been interviewed by uh, multiple national and international outlets, and her writings and commentary on Yemen can be found at In These Times. Uh, um, Marcus Stanley uh, is the advocacy director of Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. Uh, prior to that position, he was the policy director for Americans for Financial Reform, an economic advisor to Senator Barbara Boxer, uh, and a staff economist for the Congressional Joint Economic Committee. He has a PhD in public policy from Harvard University. Uh, lots of doctors here today on, on this panel and uh, really pleasure to have both of you and thank you for all of your work, uh, you know, to, uh, you know, try to reform and advance a more humane uh, foreign policy. Um, I'll start with Shireen. Uh, you know, again, thank you so much for being here with us. And, you know, this is not your first time at one of these panels. So uh, thank you for your repeated attendance and contribution. Uh, you recently wrote an op-ed about the truce in Yemen. So I would really uh, like you to walk us through what's the latest on the truce. Uh, what should congressional staff know about these negotiations that isn't really cutting through uh, the U.S. media? You know, can you give us a picture of the humanitarian situation and what's driving the crisis? And, you know, how is all of this, including what we just heard from our, uh, you know, these uh, that great uh, presentation from Priyanka and Tony, you know, how is this ongoing participation, uh, you know, affecting uh, the prospects for a long term negotiated solution? So with that, I can hand it over. Thanks so much, Hassan. And um, it's a pleasure to be here with you all today. Um, so the context of the truce, I think, to just remind folks is that, you know, Yemen has been undergoing the world's worst humanitarian crisis since 2015, where the Saudis intervened essentially in what was civil, uh, a civic um, conflict and began bombing under the pretense of supporting and reinstalling the so-called legitimate president of Yemen, President Hadi, to power. That's an important reminder because what we've recently seen is that the view the Saudis have essentially acknowledged um, by removing him from office that he was just used as a pretense for the war and was really never really the legitimate president of Yemen. Um, and they've lost credibility in, in that sense um, since he is no longer recognized as the president of Yemen. So in the context of the truce, um, this was after months of escalated attacks by the Saudis, where they disabled Yemen's internet for four days in January. They targeted water facility plants and airstrikes against civilians were escalating. And, and at the same time, the Houthis were continuing to try to capture the gas-rich province of Ma'rib, which was really the last stronghold in the north of the Yemeni slash Saudi slash UAE. Um, slash U.S. Um, coalition forces in northern Yemen, and they were not successful despite attempting for over a year to recapture that province from the government. And what they were successful in doing was to send airstrikes, successful airstrikes in both the UAE and Saudi Arabia, so they managed to target an Aramco facility in Jeddah and a fuel tank in Abu Dhabi, and I think that is what brought everybody to, to, to the negotiating table one of many negotiating tables over the past several years, but this seemed to be the most uh, successful so far. And they reached a two month truce, which began in April and was extended on June 2nd for another two months, as you've already heard. And direct talks have resumed between the Saudis and the Houthis just a couple of weeks ago. Um, as part of the truce, we, for the very first time, have had no airstrikes in Yemen. Um, which of course is, is a relief for, for civilians because we know that the impact, what the impact of airstrikes have been on Yemeni civilians um, and just the constant worry for us, those of us here who have family back home, uh, knowing that they're finally safe, at least from airstrikes for the first time in, in over seven years. There've also been no Houthi cross-border attacks into Saudi Arabia, which began after the war in Yemen began. 
Um, they're still talking and negotiating about internal blockades that have been set up by both sides in cities like Taiz and Hodeida. And so those have not yet been lifted, but negotiations are, state, are, still, are still taking place. Um, there's more fuel coming in through the port of Hodeida, but it's not completely unobstructed still. Um, there's still a blockade on medicines. Commercial flights have resumed, but only to two international cities, uh, Amman in Jordan and Cairo in Egypt. And um, certainly don't meet the demands of the Yemeni population who needs to seek, you know, um, for really mainly um, medicine abroad. And they've not been able to, to go. But for the first time, we see flights are coming in and out of Sana'a Airport. So the outside of the, the truce, outside of this negotiated um, agreements, the Saudis essentially had Hadi overnight resign as president of Yemen, and they set up a presidential council. And I wrote about this in the piece, and I uh, kind of walk folks through who this presidential council is, which essentially really amounts to a war council, unfortunately, and does not bode well for the future of Yemen. Four of the people on the council, including their leader, Rashad al Alimi, are um, allied with the Saudis and have been backed by Saudi Arabia. And they are members of either the General People's Congress Party, which is a Hadi's party, or members of the Islah Party, the Islamist Party in Yemen. Um, the other four have been funded and allied and backed by the UAE. And some of these people have conflicting goals and have fought one another. So there are people within the council who have a history of fighting one another, as well as a history of fighting the Houthis. Um, so you have among them Aydarus al Zubaydi, who is the head of the Southern Transitional Council, which seeks secession from North Yemen. And you have Tarab Saleh, who is the former president of Yemen's nephew, who kind of switched sides and is working for the Saudi, for the UAE. You have the governor Hadramot, and you have a member of the Salafist party or the Salafist group, and he was um, the head of the giant brigades, which is a UAE funded militia that defeated the Houthis in Shabwa. So the appointment of this council concerns me and a lot of people following this very closely because it was not a result of the negotiations that were taking place in Oman between the Houthis and the Saudis. And it uh, potentially signals uh, a war, a prolonged protract protracted war that continues to serve Saudi and UAE interests, but uh, with Yemeni faces this time. And we also know that Al-Qaeda is still active in so-called liberated Southern cities in Yemen. And just six hours ago, there was a um, car blast that targeted a member of the security forces that killed six people. And in two separate attacks last week, there were 10 soldiers who were killed also in the south of Yemen. So I think what Congress needs to know is that ending the war really should have meant ending it uh, and not installing you know, different puppets or different people who are gonna continue to uh, work against the interests of the Yemeni people. And um, we really need to think about the role of the UAE here. So if the US is no longer complicit in the war, that's great. We remain complicit, unfortunately, through weapon deals and support. Um, what we call offensive or defensive. We shouldn't have any kind of role in Yemen moving forward. Uh, and the UAE continues to be an active member of the war through occupying lands, including the island of Socatra and taking over oil fields. Um, and the UN Security Council has a role here that has not been fulfilled yet. So back in 2015, they passed UN Security Council 2216, which essentially was written by the Saudis and passed and allowed them to, to you know, legitimize basically their war in Yemen. Um, but this resolution has essentially been nullified given recent events and um, the UN Security Council should not be waiting to hear from the Saudis what they would like them to do next. Instead, they should be actively supporting the cause of the Yemeni people and redrafting and passing a new UN Security Council that supports um, the people of uh, independent Yemen. As for the humanitarian crisis, the currency remains in free fall. It's been bifurcated since the Central Bank of Yemen was moved from Sana'a to Aden in 2016. So essentially we have two central banks and uh, $1 currently is exchanging to about 1,100 rials in the Southern part of Yemen. This is the government run, you know, the council run parts of Yemen. Uh, whereas in Houthi run areas, it's exchanging for 557 Yemeni rials. 
And for context, one US dollar was exchanged for about $215, um, 215 Yemeni rials back in 2015 before the war. So fuel and food prices continue to remain extremely high, uh, especially wheat prices given the war in Ukraine. And there have been protests in multiple areas in southern Yemen. People are frustrated and they're committing acts of civil disobedience. They are frustrated by the council's inability to, to improve conditions for people. People have not gotten their salaries paid yet. There have been electrical cuts, um, especially coming up to the hottest months of the year now. Um, and there's a lot of uh, uncertainty about where people will get their next meal. 17.4 million people are still at risk of famine. And in the, con in the midst of all of this, the World Food Organ Program has um, had to slash their, their aid um, and is uh, restricting funding to 50% or 25% to the 13 million people who still depend on the World Food Pro Program. Travel, like I mentioned, is still restricted. And given that this is the world's worst humanitarian crisis, there are a lot of impacts on people, uh, both physical you know, and mental trauma. And um, allowing just a few flights, humanitarian flights a week, a couple of two or three a week is certainly not enough for the 20 million Yemeni people who have been impacted by the war most severely. Um, so we really need to be thinking about lifting all restrictions to ensure that Yemeni people receive the both the aid that they need uh, within the country and abroad, um, but also to ensure that warring parties do not continue to um, infringe on the rights, on the humanitarian rights of, of people. So I'll stop there and I'll wait for questions and answers from the audience. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Shireen. I really appreciate, you know, all that context, and that's going to really help us um, uh, understand this next portion that Marcus is, is going to present, um, you know, uh, and then we'll open it up for everybody uh, to answer or sorry, ask questions and then hear your responses. So again, encourage people to put any questions that you have for Shireen in the chat, there's already some that I would love to ask them. But um, w w to start us off, Marcus, you know, thank you again for being with us here. You're also uh, a veteran of, of these webinars, and we always appreciate your contribution and all the work that you've been doing uh, at Quincy. So can, first, can you give us some analysis about the president's trip to Saudi Arabia and the Middle East more broadly? Uh, you know, also give us some background on the new Yemen war powers resolution and the House and Senate. What's the update? Who's on the bill? Uh, what does the bill do? How do you think this is going to impact, uh, you know, negotiations that uh, are really, you know, you know, hopefully, you know, leads us to a, a longer term ceasefire? Uh, you know, I did also want to flag um, that, you know, as we spoke with uh, Priyanka and Tony about there was this new GAO report. And if you have any thoughts on, you know, this ongoing U.S. participation, the $60 billion of, of uh, foreign military sales to the Saudi Emirati coalition, uh, you know, also just like the lack of transparency around uh, violations against civilians. Uh, if you could, you know, kind of help us understand all of this, uh, you, you know, and, and including uh, with, you know, the Washington Post, Post expose. So thank you. Well, that was all over. Um, and uh, thank you, Saad, and, and to the other uh, panelists for uh, the contributions that you made today. I'm going to start with talking about the uh, Yemen War Powers Resolution because it's just such a powerful tool. And, uh, Hey, Marcus, uh, apologies, but I think maybe uh, the audio is, is a little bit fuzzy. I don't know if you can switch mics. Um, does this help? Or that that does help a bit. Um, yeah, I don't actually have another mic available to me right here. Um, is Okay, did, did this thing, is this making a difference or, or no? Yeah, that, that sounds a bit better. Uh, thank you.
Oh, can you unmute? Sorry. Is this better? Much better. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry. I had to fiddle with uh, uh, the system. Uh, so uh, apologies for that. It's uh, where, where we're at in modern technology, I, I guess. Um, so yeah, so I, I wanted to, support, to start with the War Powers Resolution because it is so actionable and such a powerful tool uh, for addressing all of the issues that have been raised in the, uh, in the webinar today. Uh, it is a tool for ending US complicity uh, with the war in a way that has not previously occurred. It is a, a tool for, uh, I think, strengthening the ceasefire and uh, making sure that the ceasefire uh, or encouraging uh, the ceasefire to lead to some kind of more permanent uh, resolution of hostilities. And frankly, also, uh, it puts limits and bounds on what the Biden administration uh, will be able to give away um, on this, uh, this upcoming trip to, to Saudi Arabia. So it's, or upcoming trip to the Middle East. So it's very timely. Uh, for Congress to show its commitment to ending uh, U.S. complicity with this war uh, right here and right now. Um, so what's, what's very powerful about this uh, War Powers Resolution, which as Hassan mentioned, uh, has now over 100 co-sponsors. There are, are 97 listed on, uh, on Congress.gov, and I think we're, we're over 100 now. Um, is that it, it really um, sort of puts down a very bright line about what is permissible for, uh, for the US to do in that region. Because when, when uh, the Biden administration came in, uh, we were promised uh, really significant moves to end US complicity in this war. And frankly, those did not happen. Uh, the Biden administration said that uh, they were going to end U.S. involvement in offensive airstrikes. Uh, and then the distinction between offensive and defensive airstrikes turned out, frankly, not to be meaningful. And uh, the Quincy Institute has uh, done research, uh, which I'm, I'm going to uh, drop into uh, the chat right now, the link to that, on um, Saudi airstrikes in Yemen. Uh, during the first two years of the Biden administration before the ceasefire. And uh, the pace of those airstrikes uh, did not change at all. They, they were not reduced. Uh, there was no evidence of a decline in, in offensive airstrikes. Uh, the Saudis simply claimed that their strikes were necessary uh, to, for defense against the Houthis, even when those strikes were deep inside Yemen and were killing civilians. We had peaks in the deaths of civilians earlier in 2022. So this uh, restriction on offensive airstrikes wasn't doing anything. Uh, and what the war, what this war powers resolution does uh, is um, it bans logistical support for offensive coalition strikes. And then crucially, it uh, defines that support as including any maintenance or uh, any provision of maintenance or transfer of spare parts uh, to coalition members uh, engaged in anti-Houthi anti bombings in Yemen. So this is really uh, a ban on US complicity uh, in any kind of bombing within Yemen. And it, it does continue to permit uh, defensive activity uh, if there are unmanned aerial vehicles, drones that are striking inside Saudi Arabia, you know, we can defend uh, against those, but we cannot assist in bombing within Yemen. Uh, and this is uh, well within the, the War Powers Resolution, the, the base of the 1975 War Powers Resolution, uh, which states in Section 8C of the 1975 War Powers Resolution uh, that the United States uh, cannot participate or assist in the movement of foreign military forces. And we, have, we, as we've heard earlier, we are keeping uh, those planes in the air to do offensive airstrikes, uh, and that is certainly participating in their movement. Uh, so Congress uh, certainly has the, the power um, to do that. Um, 
and this also um, th this also has a really uh, powerful impact on the diplomacy that's occurring and can occur uh, within the ceasefire and on Biden's trip uh, to the Middle East. Uh, we just heard from Shireen about the fragility of that ceasefire, uh, both in terms of uh, you, you know, it's created benefits definitely, uh, but it's very fragile. And uh, you heard Shireen say that the the Saudis uh, and the Saudi coalition has basically uh, appointed what could be a war council to return to this conflict uh, if they decide to do so. Uh, but the explicit withdrawal of U.S. support uh, for the Saudi coalition really changes the ba balance of power and it radically changes Saudi incentives around uh, returning to this conflict and gives them a very large incentive to figure out uh, a path to peace uh, that is not there if they feel they can resume bombing and US assistance to that, to that bombing will just start right up again. Uh, so it's, it's crucial for making this ceasefire stick. Um, and in addition, uh, obviously we have uh, this trip to the Middle East that is, is going on. Uh, Biden is, go is taking this trip. He wants things from the Saudis. Um, he may want uh, the Saudis to cooperate in increasing their oil production. Uh, the Saudis we know want various security guarantees uh, and he will be, Biden will be under a lot of pressure uh, to provide uh, things that the, the Saudis are asking for. Uh, and if Congress steps up and takes off the table, takes uh, U.S. assistance in the war in Yemen off the table, uh, then that is something that the administration uh, cannot provide to the Saudis. And that is something uh, that uh, the Biden administration can just say, you know, that is out of our hands. That's not even something that we can... Uh, can really negotiate on. So Congress will sort of be the bad cop in terms of limiting uh, what the Biden administration can do. And I think, you, you know, we at Quincy are very concerned about this trip because uh, we really, the fundamental issue and problem in our relationship with the Saudis, which goes much, much deeper uh, than their oil production, you know, which is something that comes and goes, and there, there are many alternatives to Saudi oil production. But the fundamental problem uh, that we have had is that we have enabled the Saudis in their activities over the years and over the decades in very destructive activities, including uh, the rise of uh, radical Sunni terrorism uh, going back to 9-11 and before, uh, this is something that the Saudis were, were uh, very involved in, uh, human rights violations, um, various aggressive actions around the region, and of course, uh, the war in Yemen. Um, and we have this, this record of either not criticizing or actively enabling uh, these very destructive and very harmful uh, Saudi activities. Uh, and I think it's really critical for Congress to say, uh, the war in Yemen is one activity that you are not going to enable anymore, that we are going to take this off the table uh, in terms of any diplomacy that happens on this trip. And uh, frankly, also, I, I would hope that Congress goes even beyond that to uh, have a say in other things that the, the Biden administration might do, like security guarantees. Uh, but I think uh, passing this war powers resolution um, to take further complicity in the war in Yemen off the table uh, for this trip is critical. So I'll, uh, I'll stop and uh, we can go to Q&A now. Uh, Marcus, thank you so much. And, and maybe we'll kind of open it up to both you and, and Shireen here for this Q&A portion. As I understand it, Marcus, you, you only have till 2.15, is that correct? I can I can uh, make it to two twenty. I think I'm sorry. I, I had a uh, uh, I didn't expect uh, a full <coughs> um, two thirty, but 
Yeah. Not a problem. Maybe I can uh, pass you the uh, uh, initial question uh -huh. um, because of your time limitations. But um, uh, Jennifer asks, um, the case has been made that the U.S. support for Saudi Arabia and by extension their operations in Yemen is essential to containing Iran's regional influence and securing Saudi Arabia's southern border from Iran-funded combatants. In your view, is there any merit to this reasoning? And this is something that, you know, we do hear. Uh, I'll, granted, I hear this less now on the Hill than I did uh, five years ago when I started lobbying on, on Yemen. And I think, that, you know, some of those narratives aren't really holding up, um, you know, as, as strongly. But uh, Marcus and even and Shireen, if you want to you take that, that'd be great. Well, I'll let Shireen take it too, but I, it, no, it is not necessary uh, to fight a, a proxy war in, uh, in Yemen in order to limit Iran's influence. I think if anything, uh, this war has backfired in some ways because it, it forces uh, Yemen to turn toward Iran for assistance in resisting uh, Saudi aggression. And uh, the, the Saudi aggression in Yemen is based on uh, their, you, you know, am, ambitions to take control and power in Yemen. It's not based on uh, a conflict with uh, with Iran, and it it sort of backfires in in uh, in terms of Iranian influence, I believe, uh, Shireen. Yeah, and uh, I agree completely. And just to add to that, you know, the um, there's been a false equivalency of the role of Iran and the role of um, Saudi Arabia in Yemen. And, um, you know, like here we are, this truce is happening, negotiations are happening and talks are, direct talks are taking place between warring parties and Iran is nowhere to be found in any of these talks because they're not involved in the war in Yemen um, in any kind of degree that has been overblown and, you know, um, mentioned over the last several years. But absolutely, if the Houthis are looking for allies, certainly they're now looking for some of the only people in the region who have not bombed them, which are the Iranians. Yeah, thank you so much for that. There's a, another question here, and I think, Marcus, you, you may have covered it, um, but maybe just to reiterate for one of our, uh, one of our questioners here, what type of military support, and I'll add weapon sales, are we still providing Saudi Arabia and the Emirates um, that are being used in Yemen right now? Well, you know, our, our first two uh, panelists were much more expert on that than, than me, but the, the core of this uh, is these, these maintenance contracts with um, with the Saudi Air Force that basically keep Saudi planes in the air. And as Hassan, I think, mentioned, uh, that's kind of a, a joint effort between military contractors and uh, military attaches, uh, uh, Pentagon personnel, uh, who are uh, providing the spare parts uh, and providing the, the, the maintenance assistance that uh, allow these, these planes to undertake these strikes in Yemen. And of course, we, we also saw uh, some arms sales to, uh, to Saudi Arabia that went through, uh, and there's concerns about offensive weapons there. But I mean, I think the heart of it is that we are permitting on a mission by mission basis, uh, these planes to fly bombing runs in, uh, in Yemen. And I know Hassan, you know something about this as well, if you wanna uh, speak as well as Shireen. Yeah, I'd also like to add that, um... Everything they have is basically what we've given them. They don't manufacture their own weapons still. They don't train and you know provide their own logistics and they still rely on US intelligence and uh, training and all of these contracts. So um, you know, they don't, there isn't a defense industry in Saudi Arabia or the UAE. So everything they have is what they've received, what they've been able to purchase largely from the U.S., but also countries like many countries in Europe and in Canada and Australia as well. Thank you both. And sometimes you do hear the claim that, well, there's no way for us to know uh, what we're what they're doing over there. And that would just be very difficult to try to track this. And and what's so amazing about what Tony and Priyanka just shared with us is that they know. <laughs> 
uh, they know exactly what squadrons are, are capable of doing these activities, and it's very a very limited number of squadrons. So I think this opens up again, you know, more opportunities for advocacy, and again, really appreciate it. Um, you know, so I, I guess I had one question specifically for Shireen. Uh, if you could tell us a bit about the Saudi blockade during this ceasefire, during this truce, you know, uh, you, you kind of touched on that a bit, uh, but, you know, yeah, what's the update? Like, Sana Airport, I haven't, I, I saw that there were several flights, but, you know, how many flights have, have left and, and really, you know, where is that all going? How is that impacting the ability for like a longer term negotiated settlement here? Yeah, so Sana International Airport has been opened for the first time in, in seven years. Um, they are accepting flights from Jordan and Amman only, so nowhere else in the world. Um, they're saying about a couple of, so a few flights a week, and then a couple of flights a week as well for uh, international aid, um, which of course is nowhere near the capacity that the Yemeni people, 20 million people need. There should be unrestricted flights. Um, Yemeni should not have to continue to negotiate their own, you know, opening up their own airspace and uh, their own borders. If we really care about the humanitarian conditions, they should not be any obstruction of fuel ships through Hodeida Airport, which, you know, there still is, and there shouldn't be any restriction on medicine coming in. But we also have to remember that after seven years of um, war that has not left anything untouched and harmed, you have hospitals that have been, you know, bombed. Half of the hospitals have been bombed entirely. The other half are still barely functioning. There's not enough medicine. There's not enough doctors. There's not enough personnel. There's not enough equipment to target the, you know, to treat people and even provide just the very basic services. Um, and so the the effects are long term. And um, we, we see a trickle of flights, I think maybe six or a few humanitarian flights have been able to come in over the last couple of months. It's just nowhere near enough what needs to happen, what Yemeni people need. And quickly, uh, the fuel, as I understand it, there has been some progress with fuel getting in. I, I saw um, there were you know several hundred thousand tons of fuel actually uh, marcus has to leave maybe marcus as, as we transition to the end if you want to give us a last word and then maybe we can have shireen give us a last word as well yeah just i i think the period leading in to this trip uh to the middle east is really crucial uh to take action to show support for this uh war powers resolution because it sends a very clear a message to the administration about Congress's uh, red lines and the the importance of this uh, situation to Congress. And frankly, at a time when we're trying to provide a global leadership to resist uh, aggression in Ukraine and support international law, it's important to send the message that uh, that we are willing to apply this, uh, you, you know, on an equal basis to uh, an even longer lasting and more destructive war. Marcus Stanley, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you, Hassan. So sorry, really, really. Oh, not a problem. Um, may, maybe, Shireen, uh, as we kind of wrap up here, I, I don't know if you have thoughts on the fuel question and maybe a final word, um, unless there's anything else, you, you know, if you want to add anything else uh, for staffers and, and folks on the call. Uh, but thank you again for your contribution. Of course, and I'm going to speak as a Yemeni American here. It's extremely frustrating, disheartening to see that, um, you know, Yemenis have just been completely neglected by um, our own policies, by our own media, um, despite what our own government has been engaged in over the last several years. And yet when the war in Ukraine began, you know, we're getting play by play, essentially. Um, we uh, importantly are, are understanding the humanitarian crisis that the Ukrainians have been living through and are hearing every last detail about the Russian aggression. And yet when we are the aggressors in Yemen, um, there's not been the same kind of attention focused on that. And maybe people don't wanna hear this analogy, but it's absolutely true. Um, we have created, helped the Saudis and the Emiratis create the world's worst humanitarian crisis. When we saw the Yemeni people being attacked in their homes and their hospitals and their schools and their funerals and their weddings, we didn't um, defend them in any way. We, and here by we, I mean the US government, um, we didn't defend them in any way. We didn't speak out against the people who were bombing them. We just decided to 
support the the, the people um, bombing and occupying Yemen. And so we have an opportunity to undo or mitigate some of this damage by passing a war of powers resolution. It shouldn't matter who the president is, whether they're Democrat or Republican. It should matter that the Yemeni people continue to suffer because of US policy and the failure of the international community to come to Yemen's aid at a time where they needed them the most. And so I would hope that we can get this war powers resolution passed and we can then start to move on and talk about justice and reparations for the Yemeni people because you know, generations are going to look back at this and um, they're not going to look very kindly about the actions and inactions of the international community when it came to what, what they've allowed to happen and what they've enabled in Yemen. Well, Shireen, thank you so much for everything that you do uh, and have done on this, um, you know, and your voice is, you know, has inspired me. Uh, I will just full, uh, you know, full disclaimer, Shireen was uh, the first person that really kind of educated me on the war in Yemen and sent my life in a, a different trajectory, actually. I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't, um, you know, for her leadership. So really appreciate you and everything that you uh, are, are doing. Uh, I wanted to thank our, our, our uh, all the panelists for being here today, all the staffers and uh, uh, civil society folks that joined us for this conversation. A uh, huge shout out to Kay Vaughn from Demand Progress, doing a lot of work behind the scenes to make this all happen. Uh, you know, uh, Demand Progress, FCNL, and Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft all uh, co sponsored this event. And um, we're going to be sending a follow up uh, note to folks, uh, you know, with some of the resources that were shared today in the chat. And again, really appreciate everybody for your continued and sustained attention on ending the humanitarian crisis and the conflict in Yemen. And, you know, let's keep going. Appreciate it.